All right, that noise helps me get ready to get into the mindset. It's, it's when I get up here and it's completely silent. I, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I get a little intimidated by this crowd. So uh, I, I need you all to be uh, a loose for us to get started. We're in, Gal- uh, in Genesis chapter four. If you've been with us over the last several months, you know we've been marching through the book of Genesis all throughout this year. And now we're finishing out chapter four. Last week, we started the story of Cain and Abel. This week, we're going to finish the the story of Cain and Abel. And so we're gonna start in chapter four, verse nine. If you have a Bible, pull that out. If not, we've got the words up on the screen. You've got it in your, your outlines that you have in front of you. We encourage you to take notes. Let's invite the Lord into our time. Lord, now speak to us. We have, uh, we have come to you with songs of praise. We've come to you with uh, prayers of sacrifice and uh, 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 prayers of praise. And, and Lord, now we ask that you would speak back to us through your word and uh, make it come alive to us, Lord. Make this book of faith uh, just become real. We ask it in your name, amen. So last week, let me just give you, for those of you who weren't here last week, we started on this story of Cain and Abel. And, and, And really the central element that most people recognize is this idea from the story of Cain and Abel is that Cain kills Abel. That's the big takeaway, right? Uh, That's sort of what, if I were to ask the person on the street, what do you know about Cain and Abel? They'd say, Cain kills Abel. And then we sort of wash our hands and go on our way. But first of all, we talked a little bit about the reasoning why Cain gets to this point last week. And we talked about the sacrifice that he gives. And if you were here last week, we remember, we we mentioned this idea that that God, uh, he gives this uh, sacrifice sort of as a quid pro quo. His heart is calculating in sacrifice. Remember this? So he comes to the sacrifice and he says, what's the minimal I can give to God to give me what I want? He is the center of it. That is, God is not the center of the sacrifice. It's, it, it's given so that he gets what he wants. So he puts himself in the center of the rule and reign of his life. But then secondly, as we come to that, we, God comes to him and says, now, after he gets angry about the fact that God rejects that sacrifice, God comes to him lovingly and says, Cain, don't let sin rule your heart. Remember that? It's crouching there. It's hidden in your anger. I've given you this thing called anger. It's part of the image of God. It's there. But hidden inside of that anger, if you don't rule over it, it will dominate and it can bring to your destruction. He doesn't rule over it. Cain kills Abel, end of story. This week, we look at the aftermath of all of that. You can't just sort of Cain kills Abel, end of story, walk away. No, there's aftermath that we have to look at and see what the scripture teaches us in the midst of that aftermath. And so let's look at what it says. Verse nine says, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. See, after the murder here, Cain, the Lord comes and asks a couple of questions. If you go back one chapter, remember when Adam and Eve fall, the Lord comes to them with a couple of questions. Similarly, he comes to Cain with a couple of questions. Just go back to Genesis chapter three and look at what the Lord says to Cain and or says to Adam says to Adam in verse nine, he says, where are you? And Adam says, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I have commanded you not to eat from? There's two questions here. Where are you and what have you done? Now, he comes to Cain similarly. He doesn't say, where are you? He says, where is your brother? And then he says, well, what have you done? All right. So we have, where are you? What have you done? And, and the question here, as we went back to Adam and Eve, it is not God coming and saying, I am lacking understanding. When God asks a question in the Bible, is it because he lacks understanding? Yes or no? No. He already knows the answer. He actually knows when he asks Cain, where is your brother? Does he know where his brother is? Absolutely, he actually says in the very next verse, I hear your brother's blood is talking to me from the dirt. I know what's happened. 
But when he asks the question, it is God giving, asking, bringing Cain to account. Remember, it was bringing Adam and Eve to account. And now God is bringing Cain to account for the actions that he has done. And I want you to note here, and that's an important element in this text, but I think more importantly, the text demonstrates, and this is the big takeaway from today, the genuine hardness of Cain's heart. Do you see it here? Do you see it in these verses? God comes and says, Cain, you know, where's Abel? What's going on? And and Cain, his response, first of all, it's a lie, and secondly, it's, Get off my back, God. <laughs> hey, leave me alone. I, I mean, look, look a flap, flipping attitude, right? Hey, I, well, I'm not my brother's keeper. You know, it's, it's the first sort of sassiness in the Bible. Yeah, I don't know. Leave me, back off, God. Get, get out of my way. I don't want to hear from you right now. And so there is this idea that he doesn't even want to engage with God in this question. And so he, he, he pushes God away. We see that indeed his heart is hardened. And it reveals to us really the most central issue in this dialogue. That it, it, not that Cain killed Abel. I think most people sort of land on that. But yes, and, and that's significant. And yes, that's horrifying. And yes, that's the presence of the serpent's work in the hearts of humanity. The introduction of murder is here. But the introduction of murder, loved ones, comes from the hardness of heart. That's the central issue here. Loved ones, the truth is we are all going to fall victim to sin. Are we not? Do we have perfect Christians here? Anybody here, right? No, not not yet. We're, We're not there. Right, we all will fall victim to sin. And so does Cain. But we actually see that Cain is not the only murderer in Scripture that God uses. Let's go through just a few of them. Go back to Moses. Anybody remember Moses? He kills an Egyptian slave master. Does God use Moses? Yes. (laughs) Let's go to David. He commits adultery with Bathsheba and then kills Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Does God use David? Yes. Let's go to Paul. Paul kills countless Christians for professing Christ. He calls himself a murderer. Does God use the apostle Paul? Yes. The central issue here is not the murder. Murder is bad. By the way, don't go out and say, hey, pastor said murder is okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that all of these men, they had their hearts softened to receive that which God wanted them to receive. But the issue for Cain here is that when God confronts him on it, he says, hey, get off my back, get off my case. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to hear from you. And so he rejects this, the, the instruction of God, and this is the hardening of heart. And loved ones, this is what we see in Scripture when God talks about the warnings for the people of Israel. Yeah, he gives them the law, but he repeatedly says, watch your hearts that they don't become hardened. I want you to look in Hosea, a very well-known text. There's, there, I, I could quote a, a variety of different places where God talks about hardening hearts, but I would just want to give you two. It says, sow for yourself, in verse 12, Hosea 10, 12, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap steadfast love. Read this aloud with me. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time that the seek the Lord, that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Let's go to another text, Jeremiah 4, 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, read it with me. Break up your fallow ground and sow thorns among them. Okay, two times, and we see this word fallow ground used various times in scripture. Now, I live in Manila. I'm not an agricultural kind of guy. You know, I'm used to traffic. I'm not used to dirt, right? But this idea of fallow ground is very significant in an agrarian culture. Fallow ground simply is ground that is unused, all right? And over time, as ground becomes unused, what happens to it? It becomes hardened and not receptive to any kind of seed. And so it was very important in that day and age that you would turn it up 
so that it wouldn't become hardened. And when you turned it up, then you would put the seed into it. So it's this idea of unused and uh, 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 of unused ground. And I don't want you to miss the imagery here in this text because we might just think when God is talking about a hardened heart, that, you know, it's just people who are mean or, or people who are not nice or uh, uh, cold-hearted or indifferent to people's hurts. They don't care about things. Oh, they're hard-hearted. You've heard that before, right? Oh, they have such a hardened heart. And we just think it's mean or something to that effect. You know, they like to throw kittens out in the street or something. You know, something brutal, right? And we just think that. That's what a hardened heart is. But that's not what a hardened heart is. A hardened heart in scripture is a heart that is not receptive to the instruction of God. Do you got that? So that, that's different than just being mean. And yeah, it leads to consequences. But when the scripture says to the people of Israel, your hearts are hardened, the ground is fallow, it means that I have been giving you instruction and you have not been opening that up. Your heart is laying dormant there to the destruction that I am trying to give you. And the main issue with the hard heart is, is, is that it's just not receptive to the word of God. Remember, God last week, he lovingly comes and he approaches Cain in his struggle with anger. If you were here last week, Cain is angry. And the Lord lovingly comes to Cain. And he approaches him and he says, Cain... I have some instruction for you. Don't let this rule you. Don't, don't get control over this. Because if you don't get control over this, this will lead you down a path that will harm you. And, and what does Cain do? I don't want to hear you from you now. I, I don't want to. There it is, right? I don't want my heart to be penetrated. I don't want my heart to receive anything. I would rather that it lay dormant. And loved ones, the longer our hearts remain dormant, the more peril that we, we find ourselves in. In fact, if you go to the book of Romans, Paul gives this warning to the people, uh, the, the first century church. He says in Romans chapter one, he says, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now I want you to follow this, right? Paul is saying these people in the past, God came to them. He revealed himself to them. He gave them instruction. He, he offered his wisdom to them. And little by little, what did they do? They, they, they rejected it. They didn't receive it. And so he says actually that their hearts are darkened, which is the same as a, a, another metaphor of you having a, a, a hard heart. And listen, it was little by little. Listen, I'm not worried. I'll, you know, you're here this morning, you're at church, and you have a hot, soft heart, and you're receptive to it. I am not worried about you tomorrow morning, you going out of UCM and saying, I have a hard heart, or anybody here just having a hard heart in the morning. It doesn't happen overnight like that, okay? <laughs> it, it just doesn't. A fallow ground does not become fallow overnight. You know how fallow ground becomes fallow? Little by little, day by day, day by day. It is a process. And in our lives, as this is what Paul is saying here, over time, God gave them instruction. God gave them wisdom. God gave them all that they needed. But little by little, they rejected it. And little by little, their hearts became harder and harder. See, the longer a field goes untouched, the harder the soil becomes. So the question for us is, Loved ones, listen closely. Is the word of God actively penetrating your hearts this morning? Is the word of God sinking in? And, and as you hear the word of God, are you responding to it? Because that's what's happening with Cain. He brings his gentle instruction. God brings his gentle instruction. And Cain says, I don't want your gentle instruction. 
And so my question for you is when you hear the gentle instruction that comes from the loving word of God, is that something that is you're acting upon that you're responding to? Because the longer that we hear that and the more that we reject that, the harder our hearts become. And that's a perilous state to be in. I was reading a book several years ago. It was called Resolving Everyday Conflict. It has nothing to do with this idea of a hard heart, but there was this wonderful story in it from the author who tells a, a time that he was observing a visually impaired woman who resisted the repeated warnings of her guide dog uh, who was trying to lead her. And this is what he wrote. It's a, a rather lengthy quote, but I think it's very, uh, very helpful for us in our conversation today. He said this, he says, one day during my morning run, I noticed a blind woman walking on the other side of the street with her seeing eye dog, a beautiful golden retriever. And as I was about to pass them, I noticed a car blocking a driveway a few paces ahead of them. And at that moment, the dog paused and gently pressed his shoulder against the woman's leg, signaling her to turn aside so that they could get around the car. I'm sure she normally followed his lead, but that day she didn't seem to trust him. She had probably walked this route many times before and knew this was not the normal place to make a turn. Whatever the cause, she wouldn't move to the side and instead gave him the signal to move ahead. Again, he pressed her shoulder, his shoulder against her leg trying to guide her on a safe path. But she angrily ordered the dog to go forward. When he again declined, her temper flared. I was about to speak up when the dog once more put his shoulder gently against her leg. Sure enough, she kicked him. And then she impulsively stepped forward and bumped square into the car. Reaching out to feel the shape in front of her, she immediately realized what had happened. She dropped to her knees. She threw her arms around her dog and spoke sobbing words into its ear. Loved ones, I think this is the perfect illustration here because the Lord lovingly leans his shoulder into us. He lovingly cuts us off. (laughs) He lovingly comes to us when we are walking in this place of blindness And and he he throws himself into us in the most compassionate way and says, I I, want to offer you some instruction. I want to offer you some guidance. And sometimes we reject that. Sometimes we get angry with it, don't we? Sometimes we we, we raise our fists to the Lord and say, I don't want to listen to this instruction. And all the while, the instruction was given for our benefit, and yet it is in our hardness of heart and the rejection of that that we find ourselves in peril. This is exactly what happens with Cain. And it can happen to the believers who continually hear the loving way of God and say, I know better than you. It leads to imminent peril, loved ones. I put number one on your outline if you're following along. Jot this down. I need to ask, am I being actively receptive to the Lord's instruction? Am I being actively receptive to the Lord's instruction? And by the way, somebody just sent me this from this, it came out this a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, a, a, the, a, a new survey that just came out. It's the State of the Bible Report for 2024. I think this is important, actually, as we're talking about this. If you look at the graphs of what's happening for believers and non-believers alike, look at after 2021, this is the percentage of people who are daily reading scripture. <laughs> After the pandemic, there is a falling off for some reason that we don't absolutely know yet, but a falling off of engagement with scripture on a daily basis. And let me just tell you, loved ones, for the body of Christ, this is dangerous. This is perilous. And you, oh, come on, pastor, get over it. Come on, you're you're just being an alarmist here. No, I'm telling you, this is what I'm talking about. When the Lord lovingly throws his shoulder into us and lovingly gives us the instruction and offers it for us, and and then we say we don't want to engage with it, we don't want to look at it, we don't want to hear it, we don't want to bring it into our lives, loved one, this is what we would say is a very perilous condition for the state of the church. 
And so my encouragement to you and, and us as a community of faith is, is don't follow this, this pattern that is happening in the world today. That we go back and there's plenty of resources that will help guide you to daily interaction with scripture. And I love all the interaction that I got regarding our devotion time for Lent and the, the different people who emailed and said it's been so good to engage daily in scripture. That is a wonderful thing. And it is the reception of the, the word of God and it, is the, it leads to the softening of our hearts. So I need to ask, am I actively being receptive to the Lord's instruction. Let's go to the next part of the text, verse 11. It says, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood at your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And Cain said, Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me Today, away from the ground and from your faith, I shall face, I shall be hidden. Now, here's the point where Cain has to face the music. <laughs> you, you, you murder somebody, there, there's a price to be paid. And, and we don't exactly know what is being talked about here. He's driven away, he has to toil in the, on the ground, um, he, he has to wander the earth. Uh, as I was looking at different commentaries, there's different approaches towards this. Some commentaries said, this is just an extension of Eden. Remember he, that Adam and Eve were exiled out of Eden, now Cain is exiled even further, right? This is the same language we heard in Eden. At, remember Adam, he had to toil the ground and it wasn't going to yield. And now Cain has a, a more severe punishment than that. Others say, no, this is just a natural consequence of when you murder somebody, you're gonna be hated. <laughs> it, you're, you're, the people that you're around are not gonna wanna be you, around you. They're gonna wanna kill you. They have instilled anger in everybody else. And Cain, in order to preserve his life, has to leave in order to have a life that is preserved. And so he has to wander around in order to be protected. He can't stay where he's at. He can't uh, work the ground. And he has to go off and, and be a wanderer. We do not really know what this means. But there is something besides all of this that is often overlooked in this whole story. And this is where I want to land for much of the rest of our time. I want you to see in this text how God comes to the rebellious Cain with tenderness, mercy, patience, compassion throughout this dialogue. Go back to verse six. If we go back to verse six, remember Cain is angry about the sacrifice. And look at how God comes to him. He says to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? What does a fallen face mean? It, as best as we can see, this is the only time this word is used in scripture. It means, <laughs> that's all it means, right? <laughs> Dropping your face. You're sad. And the Lord lovingly comes to Cain after he has offered a self-centered sacrifice. And he says to Cain, why are you so sad? And he comes with encouragement. He comes with guidance. You know, if it were me, I probably would have said, Cain, why don't you offer a good sacrifice? If you offer a good sacrifice, we wouldn't have this issue. But you louse, you wanted to offer him cheapskate and get a little by with as little as possible. You're so self-centered. But he doesn't do that. He comes and he says, Cain, why are you so, you're sad. Let me counsel you. Let me give you some advice. You're so discouraged. He comes with gentle counsel. He comes tenderly. He comes softly. He comes with kindness. But then just a few verses later, look at the king's angst again. He says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Cain is brokenhearted about this. I, I don't want to have to be driven away. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground. And from your face, I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the ground. And whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so, Cain. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Remember, here Cain is totally depressed. Lord, I can't deal with this. I, I'm gonna be a wanderer. I'm gonna be thrown. I mean, I, I'm set aside the rest of my life. I, I can't deal with this. But by the way, we don't see Cain repentant at this point, do we? 
We don't ever see him say, oh Lord, I really messed this up. I, man, I, I really blew this. We don't see that. We still see him as unrepentant to what he has done towards Abel. But there is a realization in this moment that his life has taken a dramatic downturn and God does not come to him and say, you get what you get. You earn this one, buddy. You just killed your brother and you want me to do good things for you? He he doesn't do that. You know, he he doesn't say you deserve death. He, He doesn't come with retribution and he does deserve death in all of this. He doesn't come in anger. He doesn't say, you know, I gave you advice a while ago and you rejected my advice. What do you want me to do? I told you not to allow sin to come in and you let it come in. And he doesn't chastise him in all of this. He, he, he does the unthinkable. He demonstrates restraint. Can you imagine this restraint? He, God says to him, okay, Cain, I'm going to show you mercy. I know you're worried about your situation, but I'm going to show you grace. And he says, I'm going to mark you. What patience. It's on full display for the universe to see here. The wonderful grace of God in chapter 4 for the unrepentant whom God still shows favor and mercy to. There's a little tiny commentary I have in my office. I don't recommend it by Derek Kidner. It's not very exhaustive, but he he wrote something on this verse that I found deeply profound. He said, God's concern for justice for the innocent is matched only by one other thing, his care for the sinner. Don't you love that? Even the querulous, so this means whining. We don't use querulous too often in our language, but even the whining prayer of Cain had contained a germ of an entreaty. God's answering pledge together with this mark or sign. It's not a sign or a stigma, but it's a sign of safe conduct. It's almost a covenant making him virtually his protector. It is the utmost that mercy can do for the unrepentant. Do you get what it says? He comes to the unrepentant murderer and he says, I am going to be your protector. I'm going to put a sign on you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to demonstrate what what mercy and grace. We, We get another glimpse in the heart of God towards humanity. Remember, we go back to Adam and Eve. When they fell, God goes to the outside of the garden And he he makes a sacrifice for them and he puts a coat upon them and he blesses them. And and he says, you're still going to be my heirs. You're still going to be my my, 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 my offspring. I still am going to love you. And then you go even further. Now Cain, he kills somebody. And God says, I'm still gonna put my mark upon you. God's love for humanity is crystal clear in this text, even for those who have rejected him. God so loved the world, not just the good people. He loves the humanity. He loves them all here. And notice he says, I'm, the, the seal, this mark. Now we don't know what this mark is. It's interesting, we can, uh, if you look at a variety of different commentators, some people say God gives Cain a tattoo, okay? The first tattoo in scripture. Bet you didn't know that, right? Because it's the same word later on that God uses for people who mark themselves. And so they're saying there's God with the tattoo gun sort of, you know, putting it on on Cain. Highly unlikely, but some people say that's what happened. Ancient scholar before the time of Christ, uh, 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 of the uh, Torah, he actually said that this is God giving Cain a guard dog, (laughs) that everywhere that Cain went, he had this big guard dog. I sort of picture this massive, you know, Rottweiler next to him, and anybody who would come next to Cain, he would sick his dog on. That's actual commentary that I, I read this week. The truth is, we have no idea what the mark is, but there is some kind of mark where God says to the unrepentant sinner, I am putting my seal on you, I'm putting my mark on you, and no one will touch you. What a covenant that God is making. What great mercy that God shows towards Cain. And and by the way, I would even go further and say, if you look at the next few verses, God even blesses Cain. Look, Look at what the text says. Go to verse 20. It says, Ada bore Jabel. This is Cain's descendants, by the way. So he's blessing the descendants. He says, he was the father of those who dwell in the tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who play the lyre and the pipe. 
Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of brawn and iron. This is all advanced stuff. You know, it's not like you go down to the steel shop back in the day. The forgers of iron and bronze were advanced civilization. Those who made instruments, advanced civilization. Those who lived in the tents were advanced civilization. And God is actually blessing Cain's descendants. I want you to think about all of this. Here comes Cain. Or here comes God. He is the protector. He's the counselor. He's the comforter. He's the encourager. He's the blesser of the unrepentant sinner. I don't get it. <laughs> Certainly doesn't go in your DNA, does it? It's not sort of the attitude that we have naturally coming out from us. Why would God allow a murderer to receive any kind of blessing from him? Because of God's goodness. His character is on display for the people of Israel. His patience is on display in the first chapters of Scripture. Now, let me be clear. This is not, we're not talking about salvation, the ultimate blessing here. But let me be clear. It is the mercy that allows even the unrepentant to be loved by God. Now, why is this important? Two points of application. First of all, it is the kindness of God that often leads people to his repentance. Get that? When God shows kindness over and over and over again, it is often that which compels people to come to him. This is exactly the point that Paul makes in Romans chapter two. He says it was God's ongoing kindness in our rebellious state that led to us saying what a great God we have. Let me illustrate this. The best way I can illustrate this is through the story of somebody by the name of Frank Schaefer. Now, if you're a theologian here, which probably not too many of us are, you would be familiar with a name called Francis Schaeffer. Francis Schaeffer is a very well-known theologian from the 20th century. He and his wife wrote several different texts on the, the greatness of God. Now, his son, Frank, their son, Frank, absolutely hated God. <laughs> totally wandered away from the things of God, became an artist with profane things of God, made, wrote profane things about God, and, and absolutely came to the point where he rejected the faith of his parents, absolutely to the chagrin of his parents, I'm sure. And yet in the middle of all of this, his mother, Edith, was always supportive and compassionate. When she passed away a couple of years ago, he, she, be, before, he, he wrote a eulogy for her, and in this eulogy, he describes all the ways that his mother would show unconditional love. Even after he would publish a profane book, she would write and say, congratulations, your book was published. I love you so much. I'm so proud of the talents that you have and these types of things. And, then he, and he writes this in, in this eulogy. He said, mother praying with me every night before turning out the lights, she let me in on her best secret. The universe is not a hard, cold, lonely, meaningless place, but a cosmos full of love. Mother never making a sarcastic remark about her children or anyone else and the lifelong self-confidence that that gave me. Mother cleaning up my vomit after I took drugs and then fixing me poached eggs and toast as if I was three again. Mother buying me art supplies. Mother's horror at the harshness as she put it, of so many evangelical religious people and the way they treated the lost and her saying that no wonder no one wants to be a Christian if that's how we treat people. Maybe everything has changed for me theologically, but some things haven't changed. I'm still thinking of mom's eternal life in her terms because she showed me the way to that hope through her humane and she won. Her example defeated me. The day before my mother died, my last words to her were, I want you to know your prayers for your family have been answered. I credit every moment of joy to your prayers. I miss her voice. I learned to trust that voice because of life witness that backed it up. And here's the part I want you to land on. I know I will hear her voice again. You won, mom. I believe. I believe. 
How does the one who is profane come back to, who has rejected God, come back to, you won, mom, I believe. It is through the love and the compassion of the profane. It is the one that extends the heart and the mercy. It is the one who, who shows the kindness. See, he's saying, mom still loved me and demonstrated love towards me in my rebellion. And loved ones, this is what Cain, this is what the Lord does with Cain. This is what the Lord does for you and I. He says over and over again, I still love you. I will still help you in the vomitous life that you have created. I will be your protector, even as your heart is hardened toward me. What enormous restraint and grace that God demonstrates here. This is the compelling kindness of God that Paul says softens even the hardest heart. First thought. Second Second thought, if this is the example that God gives towards Cain, we are made in the image of God. Why is it that we do not treat our fellow citizens the same way? Why is it that those who have hardened hearts towards God, we often treat with disrespect and dishonor? We, we have to replicate the compassion of God that God, for, for those who have no regard for him. There, there's a lot of foolish things being done in our world today. Would you agree? There's a lot of foolish things. I, I turn on the news and I go, what are they thinking? That is about as profane as you can be. That is about as much as you can disregard the truths and the, and the way of God as possible. And, and in my heart, I want to lash out. <laughs> in my heart, I, I want to speak poorly. And it's happening all over. The church can become so hostile and so combative and so full of retribution. We are outraged and we are constantly looking for reasons to be outraged. Many Christians take the attitude, well, that person rejects the Lord. I don't have to be kind to them. I don't have to embrace them. I, I don't have to bring them into my life. I don't have to care about them. I don't have to listen to them. I just need to be angry and outraged at what they're doing. That is not the way of God in Cain, is it? He comes lovingly. He comes sweetly. He comes tenderly. He comes compassionately. He comes with patience. He comes with protection. He comes with all the fullness of kindness to the one who absolutely rebels against him. And that is the image of God that he says you should have. Do we have it, loved ones? I put number two, last thing on your outline this morning. I need to ask, am I replicating God's grace to the unrepentant around me? Am I replicating God's grace to the unrepentant around me? Am I replicating the image of God to the world? Finally, last part of this. We want to go to the final text here in this chapter. And really, this, this is really, it, it bothered me, I suppose, this week as I was studying it. God demonstrates such kindness, such grace, marks him, he seals him, gives him a dog maybe, I don't know. <laughs> you, you know, he, he does all this kindness. And we never see Cain repent. We see him reject the Lord, right? As we mentioned last week, the way of Cain is not something that you want to be identified with in Scripture. It's, it's, it's not good in, in biblical language. In fact, Josephus, the early uh, Jewish historian of the first century, said Cain was wholly evil, and he instilled evilness in his family. We actually see this happen. If you go down to the next verses, this is how it ends. You have verse 23, Lamech, the song of Lamech. It is... Cain's grandson, great-grandson. And this is what Lamech says. It's a song, by the way. Keep in mind, when's the last song we heard in the Bible? The last song we heard in the Bible was the song that Adam sings to Eve. Remember? At last. How good that was? If you were here, he, he rejoices in this wonderful, wonderful thing that God has made. At last. Second song in the Bible, not so good. Look at the words of the song. This is Cain's great-grandson. says, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, 
then Lamech is 77-fold. What is he doing? He's writing a song about what a great killer he is. <laughs> what a great murderer he is. You know, Cain killed a man, but he's only got seven-fold. I am like the best killer on the planet right now. Dr. Steve Pardue from the first service at IGSL, he's a professor there, he said, this is the first sign of gangster rap in, the, in all of humanity, right? This idea where we were singing about and celebrating wickedness. They're making songs. It goes from at last, what a wonderful thing God has done to look at me. I'm a wicked person. I'm proud of it. Why? We don't see Cain ever repent. We don't see Cain ever try and correct the ship. We don't see Cain ever changing the behavior. We see that Cain is celebrating this. And so, of course, by the time we get to the grandson, well, that great granddad, he did a great job of killing people. So, well, I, I want to do it now. In fact, somebody sent me an article this week about what's happening in Haiti. It, the exact same thing is happening right now. Warlord turns to death, rape, and rap videos to expand control. What he's doing, he's going to hip-hop, and, and, or uh, TikTok, and, and in TikTok, he's posting all of these rap videos about how he's killing people and how he's doing terrible things and you better come and follow me. This is happening right now and I'm thinking that's actually what's happening with Cain. That's a good parallel. That's how wicked Cain's situation had become. Now, what happens after this? Nothing. The story ends right there. That's it. That's all. You know what happens if you look at the next verse? It says, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son called Seth. God says, I'm done with the line of Cain. I'm done with the Cainites. I'm gonna go back. Let's go to the main story. I'm done. And he leaves them to themselves. And we don't hear anything else from the Cainites. This is not the Canaanites, by the way. This is the Cainites. Canaanites are a different people altogether. The story ends. Isn't that sad? Your parents are Adam and Eve. They loved God. They walked with God in the garden. You were talking with God. And now it's over. The story ends. Loved ones, the story ends for those who ultimately are going to reject God. Who keep God at great length. The story ends. There's a sadness there for those who remain hard-hearted. Unlike those who hear God's voice, receive God's voice and God's instruction, and God says, come, dwell with me forevermore. God says, I will be your people, or you will be my people, and I will be your God, and I will be with you. What a wonderful thought. But for those who are hardened, the story ends. See, loved ones, in this story, we see the love of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God. It's all on display and it is never questioned here. The question comes back to you and me. How do we receive it? Is your heart softened to the voice of God as he puts his shoulder in and gets in front of you do you receive that? Because all along the way, his love is everywhere. The false narrative that we buy into is God is vengeful, God is mean, God is out to get us. That's a false narrative. <laughs> He's always putting his shoulder in lightly and lovingly. And sometimes we're kicking it and yelling and screaming. And he says, I'm still there, I'm leaning in, I'm leaning in. Loved ones, how is your heart? Is it going the way of Cain? That's a serious question that everybody needs to answer. Lord, I pray that you would help us in this instruction to be reminded of your wonderful grace and compassion. You would remind us again today of how you lovingly lean in and that when we reject that and we are hardened hearts, that it leads to nothing good in our lives. We stand in awe and appreciation 
of your grace and mercy. And we give you thanks. Amen.